Welcome to Smash Avro Property. Today, I'm speaking with Michael Migiani. He's a 23-year-old who just purchased his first investment property. Michael is very humble and admits he is still learning. However, I think he understands a lot more than he realizes and has even outsourced other resources to help him make some of those big decisions, including using a buyer's agent to purchase in a whole other state, being involved financially in the family home for security and implementing delayed gratification from day one. You know, when you start getting your first pay, I was like, oh, never had $1,000 before in my account. I was like, if I, if, I, if I don't spend this, then I'll have $2,000. I've never had $2,000 in my account. And it was just kind of that, how much money can I get that, you know, how high can I get it sort of thing. All my mates were wanting to go, you know, go out for dinners every night of the week. And I was just like, nah, if I go out for dinner, next time I get paid, I'll only have $1,900. So, but if I don't go out, then when I get paid, I'll have over two grand. As always, seek your own professional financial, legal, and property investing advice for your current situation. Everything we talk about is just our opinion and general in nature and should never be considered as personal advice. So without any further ado, let's get house hunting with Michael. Michael Migiani, welcome to Smash Every Property. Hey, mate. How are you? Very, very well. Welcome, welcome on board. I'm, uh, I'm pretty wrapped to get you on here. I uh, scrolling through my LinkedIn the other day and uh, saw a, a post from a former guest of the podcast, Daniel Walsh, and it was a, a client uh, referral, mate. And it was, uh, it was yourself. And uh, you're, you're a young man, very uh, positive and, and happy, and just bought your first home. So I uh, reached out to Daniel and, and wanted to get yourself on. But I'm very intrigued about yourself, mate. We've had a, a bit of a back and forth. Uh, off air beforehand and uh, you sound like a pretty cool guy, mate. So I'm interested to delve into your story and, and what you do and what you're about. So um, to get us started, why don't you give us a little bit of a background about yourself, how old you are and, and what you're currently up to? Yeah, mate. Look, I'm, I'm 23 years old, so I'm pretty young. Just started, I've always wanted to get into the property market and I finally made that leap, um, you know. So I've just bought my first investment property on the side. I currently, I'm also an emergency service worker. But, you know, other than that, obviously, that's not going to get me to sort of where I want to be with my goals. I needed to do something a little bit extra. And um, the, way I, the way I feel and is that property could give me that, that little bit extra. Like growing up, everyone always told me they wish they invested in property from a young age. So I sort of didn't want to make that mistake and, uh, you know, um, and want to get into that mindset later in life. I thought, well, if, they're all mistake, if they all made that mistake, I want to sort of get into it while I am young and while I can. Um, to give myself, um, yeah, the better opportunities later in life. So, yeah, get in there and get going. That's where I'm at right now. Um, so far, everything's going good, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect, mate. And I think, um, you know, that's a, a big one that I want to emphasize as well is just learning from other people's mistakes and, and, you know, what they sort of say. So it sounds like you've grasped some of uh, these other successful peoples in your life and sort of listened to what they've had to say and, and really taken it by the hordes and, and gotten into yourself. And why don't you talk to us a little bit about, you know, who, who these people are? What they, are they mentors? Are they people in your family? I mean, what sort of triggered that whole sort of property investing conversation and who were the people around you who were talking about it yeah so the people in regards to what made me want to do it is it, it was just people who haven't even done it themselves in a way and as silly as that sounds it's people that are just sitting there and it's all like oh i wish i did this i wish i did this even though they still can but they never did it they never wanted to do it they always thought it was too hard and um, i'm one of the people that think i don't think nothing's too hard if one person's done it before then why can't i and in regards to who's actually helped me make that sort of my, my dream a reality, that would definitely be Daniel Walsh being the buyer's advocate for your property, your wealth. I reached out to Daniel and I told him what my plans were and what I wanted in life. And, you know, everyone my age, obviously, as you probably know yourself, they all think that it's impossible. Um, I thought I could do it and Daniel pretty much motivated me and said, well, you can do it. So I put my, you know, I put my dreams uh, into pretty much, I just actioned them and so far, not only surprise myself, but I've got one property now and by the sounds of it, like if it all goes well, um, you know, I'll have a second one before I know it because, you know, yeah, that's with, with the help of the buyer's advocate. I don't want to be that person like everyone else around me who said they wish they'd done that and they just sit on their ass and they do nothing. <laughs> um, I want to actually, yeah, get out there and do what I want to do, chase those dreams. 
Yeah, I love that, mate. And it's, um, you know, I'm glad that you, you brought up the buyer's agency and, and how you, you decided to go down that route. I think that's a, a phenomenal thing for, for someone of your age to do it. I mean, a lot of people sort of look at buyer's agents these days and, and think their cost is too expensive or, you know, scared of getting the wrong investment advice and all that sort of stuff. I mean, um, you know, my listeners have definitely heard Daniel as he's been on the podcast before and, and know what his insights are. So, uh, uh, we can give them a thumbs up for that. But, um, you know, just looking at buyer's agency, it's kind of, you know, it's a big cost and you kind of get lost in, you know, is it worth it? Are they going to be the right ones? Are they going to give me the right advice and all that sort of stuff? So talk to us about sort of um, how that backstory happened for you. Did you did you find it out in a paper or <laughs> how did you uh, come, come by Daniel? Look, it's, it's quite funny. Like I was just, I was just Googling investment properties. I was trying to find, anything to read up on, you know, putting, getting my, yeah, getting started. And, um, I think there was a, I could download a quick ebook from Daniel. And obviously when I did that, I put my email in there and there was an automatic email or something was sent from your property, your wealth, Daniel's business. And from that I was like, okay, yeah. And then I, then I followed him on Instagram. Um, and after that, you know, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll ask him questions. I'll see what he's all about. Um, and thinking, well, this looks like a pretty good business and all that. I'm probably not going to hear back, but it surprised me. He pretty much replied back in like the next five minutes. And I was, I reckon I was talking to Daniel for almost eight months before I even made that, made that step to go with him. Cause like what you said, yeah, it's, um, it's very hard, the costs, you know what I mean? Some of them can be very expensive, but, um, one thing that I got told throughout my journey in investing in property and what stuck by me. It's like, why should I go to, why would I go to a family barbecue and listen to my uncle who might be a mechanic? Um, why should I listen to him and get his insight on how I should invest in property when he's just a mechanic and he doesn't invest in property himself? Or I can reach out to Daniel and yes, pay them the money that, that I have to pay them and it can be pricey. And, but, and the, but then again, Daniel lives and breathes the property market. You get what I'm saying? I'm not going to go to Daniel to sort of fix my car because that's his, his, his business is property. So if I want to work on my property, of course, I need that person whose business is property. You know, do you get what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, I need, 100%. You need, to surround yourself, you need to surround yourself with people who are already in that industry and who are better than you so you can, you know, build up yourself, like, you know, and expand your own knowledge um, for the better results. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely perfect. And I love how you, you brought up the family barbecue and the uncle because that's the, the typical story, unfortunately, is, um, you know, well, that's, we like said, that's, that's sorry. That's what, yeah, exactly. That's what sort of sold me on it. And yeah, you pay them X amount of money, but that X amount of money that you've paid a buyer's advocate could make you twice that amount of money rather than if you made a mistake and bought the wrong property. Oh, a hundred percent spot on. And, um, you know, they, they've, they've invested all their time and education and, and learnings and, and doing it themselves and strategies into the, you know, their history of building their portfolio. So you're, you're not paying for a service, you're paying for their knowledge really, which is, um, so crucial in, in when you think about, you know, you know, someone like yourself who's 23, you've got the rest of your life ahead of you. If you hold on to that asset for the next, 30 years, you're going to laugh at the cost of, of getting a buyer's agent now. Like it's just going to see, seem insignificant to um, that, that long-term investment hold. But um, yeah, just back to the, to the barbecue story. Like that is, that is the, the general story is, you know, we're, we're younger, we, or, you know, we, we want to buy a property and we hear an uncle or a family member say, Oh, I just bought this property and it's grown in value by a hundred K and, you know, sometimes people, you know, all respective family members and everything else, but a lot of people talk up a lot of stuff as well. And so how you actually know those numbers are real. And then, you know, some people get caught up in, in buying a block around the corner next to mum and dad. And, you know, cause that's all the area that they know and they don't understand that there's so many things that go into what actually increases the value of property over time. And so um, reaching out to someone who, who does have that knowledge and information is, is super important for your financial wellbeing. So um, hands down, mate, I think you, you've done a great job there and, and especially in uh, finding a, a someone who can help you in that area. But take us back to um, when, when you were growing up, when you were younger, was it, was it, was money talked about in the household? I mean, what sort of inspired you to sort of save when, when you were and, 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 and was it a hard journey? Yeah, in regards to money, so no, nah, not really. The only thing is what I looked at and I've just 
it's mostly the one thing that I am good at. You think my family weren't really like, well, yeah, we were, we were all right, but we weren't the best either. We just were, you know, if we wanted something, we'd go get it. But we weren't definitely weren't wealthy. I can tell you that. But one thing I don't know. My grandpa more so was like, you know, save your money, save your money, save your money. Maybe because he was Bob Maltese, but <laughs> um, but yeah, I suppose that's just one thing that I've realised. Like, one thing that annoys me is people, young people, who go out and they go and buy a brand new car and they go buy all these nice things and so it looks like they've got money. So then you've got this person on the left side who's got the nice car, nice this, nice that. He looks like he's got money, but realistically, all his money's gone in those nice things to come up with that persona that he's got money. Now, I myself, I looked on, I looked on car sales or whatever. I looked for the cheapest car, 2000 as long as it had a roadworthy and sacrificed all my money just so I could save more. Because the way I look at it, if you sacrifice now, it was just, I don't know, it's just something that I sort of, I don't know if it's, it wasn't, I just sort of just, I don't know. It's just I come up with myself in a way. You know what I mean? It wasn't really. No one told me to do it. I just knew that if I sacrifice now with all those things, I didn't need to act like I had money because if you sacrifice today, it is about that 10, 15, 30 years down the track where those sacrifices will get you the better results. Yeah, uh, that's phenomenal, mate. And when you think about that sort of car scenario, like if you went and bought a, a $40,000 car, for, let's say, you know, on top of that, as soon as you drive it out of the dealership, it, it's it's going to drop in value by 30% or whatever, 15% or whatever it may be. And then every year after that, due to depreciation, it's going to continue to come down in value. So after five years, you know, it, it might be worth 30 or 40% of what you actually bought it for. And then on top of that, which a lot of people don't really understand is inflation. And, and what inflation is, the, the cost of money um, decreases over time. So if you put $1,000 in the bank last year, it's actually worth, it, inflation is 3%, let's say, for example. If you put $1,000 in a bank account last year, it's actually worth $997 this year in, in last year's money. So the, the cost yeah. of money, it, the value of money is, is constantly coming down. So when you combine that with a $40,000 car that you're now paying, interest on from the bank because you borrowed a loan then the car's depreciating and you put inflation on top of that it's just that people don't understand how uh, easy it is to drown financially with these repayments and and the worst part about that is you know after five years they sort of uh, want to keep that persona up as you say and so they go and buy a new car and they refinance the old car uh, they, they sell the old car they trade in the old car and it's just this constant battle of uh, the, the persona and trying to seem wealthy but really behind the scenes they're, they're struggling financially and that's why it's so easy to get caught behind but um, yeah I love that uh, analogy mate you did really well there and um, it's very interesting that you're, you're came up with that yourself you know buying the, the least amount of cars so you don't lose money that, that, that's awesome so um i mean talk to us about that that sort of savings journey i mean um did you start when you were really young did you start with your first job i mean what was your first job you know how much were you earning all that sort of stuff was it was it a long process were you saving up until you bought your first one or was there sort of a, a trigger point where you went okay i really want to buy a property now i'm going to start saving harder yeah i suppose from the as soon as I started work, my first job, I was like 15 or something. It was just a food works, a supermarket. And, um, you know, when you start getting your first pay, I was like, oh, I've never had $1,000 before in my account. I was like, if I, if, I, if I don't spend this, then I'll have $2,000. I've never had $2,000 in my account. And it was just kind of that, how much money can I get that, you know, how high can I get it sort of thing. All my mates were wanting to go, you know, go out for dinners every night of the week. And I was just like, nah, if I go out for dinner, next time I get paid, I'll only have $1,900 so. But if I don't go out, then when I get paid, I'll have over two grand. And it was just like, I knew where I wanted to be. And I knew the property was my main goal. And it's not easy. I'm telling you, it's not easy. I needed um, a lot of money for the house deposit. And actually, I wanted to start it earlier. But um, it was just, you just got, it's like, it all comes down to that sacrifice saving. Like my parents went through a divorce. So me, my mom and my brother were renting a house. So we, did, we didn't want to rent. We wanted to buy a house. So before I actually got my investment property, we had to sort of put in together to buy a house. So that kind of put me back a little bit. But then because I did that and my name was already on another mortgage, I had to sacrifice even more and save even more because I needed a much larger deposit. But, you know, I'm sort of going off track here. But what I'm trying to say, it's, it's just all about, it's, I know there's temptations, but it's once again, if you sacrifice bought sacrifice and get past those temptations to chase that bigger goal that might cost more it's that's when you get your result and that's when you get your reward it's much more it's much better to put it into something like the house 
even though it's going to take you four or five years to save a deposit rather than go out for those dinners every week. Yeah, that's that that whole delayed gratification piece. And I do love that you go off track, mate, because you uh, you delved in, you alluded into a very interesting scenario there. So talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, you, you your brother and your mum bought a property together. How old were you then? That was obviously your first one. And, and, and sort of how did that look? Yeah, so... So I was like, um, so, you know, we had to, so that cost just a little bit, but in regard, like I said, it all comes down to the main thing about buying that house was obviously, you know, cause my mum doesn't work. So me and my brother put our heads together and sort of thing. We bought this property just so, you know, mum, especially her money is sort of not the whole dead money, rent money, which renting is not always bad. Don't get me wrong, but because she doesn't work, at least when this property goes up, she'll have some money there. Um, but the main thing was getting this. It just comes, the biggest thing about buying at one house, it's like, so now my house is on, I'm 23 years old and my house, my name's on two houses. It all comes down to once your name's on a few houses, it's that hard to get to the next one. And it's always harder to save that little bit extra. But yeah, for sure. Yeah, here, yeah go on. And and uh, just talk to us about the because the the first home loan deposit and um, first home owners grant and all that sort of stuff back then you know it was a pretty big thing. Oh. Was that something that you used? And and obviously it well, sounds like you couldn't recycle that into the second one. Well, that's it. No, I couldn't. So we we put we needed a, um, about a for this house. I think we put down about a seventy thousand dollar like. Um, down payment to get the house, obviously, to get the mortgage. Um, and because me and my brother never bought a house, there goes my first home buyer's grant as well. Mm. So now mm. I wanted to get, you know, if I, if I used my money and I could for the first investment property was my first ever house, the, you know, yeah, that um, first home buyer's grant is always helpful. But the next one, I didn't have it. So when I started my first investment property uh, last year, it was with no first home buyer's grant or nothing. And I couldn't use the equity in this house because it just simply wasn't fair. I just thought, no, look, I'll leave that there. We need that for other things. And I just had to save, 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 save. And it was just all cash deposit sort of thing. Um, and that's exactly what I'm going to have to do for my next um, property when I've already got two under my name. It's hard, <laughs> but when you work hard, you know what the rewards are going to be. So it's worth it. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, you, you, you're accomplishing a, a life achievement as well. You're, you're making sure you, you and your mom and your brother are all secure and got a, a property under your name. And, you know, he, as you say, not all uh, rent money is dead money, but it is kind of dead money if, if you're not in an investment property, you know, it's kind of just sitting there saving while you can and, and, and paying someone else's mortgage until you've got enough to buy your own property. So you did the right thing there. And obviously, um, you, you know, you've helped your family out significantly, which is, which is pretty important in life, I would guess so too. And not to say yes. uh, not only that, but you've got, you know, two properties underneath, underneath your name. You might, you might be in with other people as well, but you know, a lot of, not a lot of people at 23 can say that they've got two properties uh, under their name. So it's a, it's another achievement in themselves. So, um, Talk to us about the, the second purchase. I mean, obviously, you've had to save a significant amount of money to, to get in there without any, without any um, sort of leverage from the government. But um, how long did it take you to save for that second one? Was it sort of that same scenario where you weren't going out, you weren't spending or anything like that? You've been quite frugal with your money. Yeah, pretty much. Look, look I've been saving it. Like, I used some money since my first ever job in it too. I ended up having about $90,000 in the bank. Um, and after I bought the house, I had about twenty five, twenty thousand dollars left. It just comes down to that sacrifice, you know. Those, you know, it just comes down to small things. Like don't, I was, I was, you know, real tired on my money um, because I knew I wanted to do property. Like when I say the, when I say ninety thousand dollars, you know, and when I say it's hard or and all that, it's hard, but it's easily achievable. It just comes down to, like what I said, you don't need to. Like it comes down to. Or why, why, why do you need to buy a $100 T-shirt when you can go buy a $10 T-shirt? It's those things. And when you start to realize those things and being young, you're surrounded by a lot of people who do go buy those $100 T-shirts. So the temptation's always there. But being young, when, you, when I realized that um, and I realized those easy things, if you just tweak those easy things and say, hang on a second, I don't need to go spend that much money on that when I can buy it for you know, a tenth of the price, that's when you see your money grow and it grows quick just by those little things. And then before you know it, four years down the track, three years, two years, there's your deposit and now you've got a house. Yeah. And I think it's hard, that's just, but it's achievable. 
Uh, yeah, I totally agree. I think it's a hard thing, you know, for, for young people like like ourselves, like uh, growing up in high school. I mean, I don't know what it was like for you, but for me, you know, buying those sort of, you know, shirts like Rip Curl and, you know, all these surfing brands and all that sort of stuff, you know, it's kind of a, a status thing. Like you weren't cool unless you were wearing that sort of clothing. And so it's kind of, it's a, it's a big mind shift to move out of that and say, well, I don't really, like, I don't really care what other people think about what I'm wearing. Like I, I still want to look good, but I, I can still look good in a $10 t-shirt, you know, and it's just about switching that mindset of, of, of coming out of that, you know, being driven by that, that status. And I guess that's we're sort of retouching on what we said earlier on is, is just this persona of being wealthy or persona of being well off when, when really, you know, behind the scenes, there's so much stuff that could be going on and, and you're not in a, in a ideal financial situation. And did, did you find that coming out of high school? I mean, what was it like for you back then? In regards to what exactly, sorry, you're asking, like, like just, um, just, uh, you know, that, that persona of buying a hundred dollar shirts and all that sort of stuff and sort of keeping up with the Joneses, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? It actually, um, I kind of looked at people and I laughed as, as weird as it is, cause you can, it was right in my face and I said, I could, I can see straight through it. You know, you look at someone or whatever and it's like, look at this guy. He thinks he's got all this money in the world, but he spent all this money on his car loans. He's this, he's this, he's this, this and this. And I just sit back in my little $2,000 car and I laugh. I'm happy. I was like, you know, if I live like that, trying to live out of my means, I would get nowhere. But it make, that motivated me to keep doing what I was doing and to live in my means and to keep sacrificing for that better result. And when it was in my face, it actually made me think, well, good, I'm on the right track. He can act like he's got everything in the world, but I'm just going to stay on my path and I know what I'm chasing for. Yeah, mate, that's uh, that's phenomenal, especially for a, for a young guy like yourself, just to to sort of see the world from from those glasses at a young age is is phenomenal, and um, I'm sure you're going to go pretty far. And talking about your future and uh, trying to get back on the topic of property investing, I mean, what's uh, what, what do you see the future looking like? I mean, what's your goal for property investing? I mean, where do you, where do you go from here? You've alluded to getting the third one at some point, but I mean, where do you see yourself in, in sort of 5, 10, 30 years? Yeah, so look, I normally just count, I've count that I've got the, the first investment and I, want, I do want a second one and I do want it quick because once I get the second one, it'll be a lot easier because of equity and all that sort of stuff. But my goal is to have my second property at some, or the deposit at some stage next year. And like I'm struggling, but a little bit with the saving because of this, uh, the first one. But look, it's not going to set me off my goal. I do think it's achievable. But in the next 30, 30 years, uh, or the next, even the next 10, 15 years, I'd love to have, yeah. It's about seven properties plus. Like I went to I went to Daniel Walsh and I can't yeah, I can't praise him enough. And I said, Look, I'd love three properties by the time I'm thirty. And he said, Okay, and he you know, but then working with Daniel Walsh, now I'm sitting here at home and I'm thinking, you know what? I could probably do heaps better than three properties by the age I was thirty. And um but I need him on my side to do that. If I did it on my own, I could make these little mistakes. But with Daniel Walsh on my side, I definitely think my goal of three properties, I could smash that out of the park. And that's definitely my goal. It's that financial freedom. And he talks about that a lot. And I can get that from property rather than where I'm working right now. I can, if I do both, I'll be laughing. Hopefully. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, yeah, no, hundred percent. You know, we've all got to work to, to bring in the income, but um, instead of living paycheck to paycheck, you're, you're setting up your, your financial well-being into the future. And, you know, it's all about setting those little goals. Like if you can see, if you can see that your, your goal can get bigger and bigger and bigger, why not go for it? Especially when you've got people, you know, very experienced and with great knowledge behind you, you know, backing you and saying, giving you reinforcements and, and saying you can achieve better. I mean, why not really? So, um, yeah, talk to us about the, your first investment. I mean, what sort of area did you buy in? Were you, were you at Toss and Attorney? You said it was a bit of an eight-month process. It was a long process. I mean, walk us through those eight months. Did you, did you learn a lot in that experience? Did, you, um, did your mind change heaps? I mean, what sort, of, what sort of was going through the process then? Yeah, I wish I wasn't eight months. I wish I started earlier. You know, I wish I... Um the first time I reached out to Daniel, I was umming and ahhing. He brought it up before. It's the cost, you know. And I, I, you know, I wish I didn't. I wish I didn't see that cost as a bad thing. Uh, and I wish I jumped into it earlier. To be honest, was it scary buying my first investment property as much as I wanted to do it? Yeah, bloody oath it was. Did I want to buy something around my local area because that's all I knew? Yeah, it was. 
all of a sudden now I've got a property in Brisbane. You know, I never would have thought I would buy interstate. I, you know, and with Daniel's team and Daniel's support on the side, I've bought that house and um, it's ran so smooth um, and it's interstate. You know what I mean? Like from Daniel's taking me out of my comfort zone and then some. And being out of your comfort zone is obviously the best time where you grow. But I would have never, would have never done this. Um, and I, like I said, I would have just bought somewhere in the area where I know I wouldn't have even researched properly or looked into it or wouldn't even known what to look into if the property was going to, if the area was going to go up with infrastructures and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, I just wish I started sooner, to be honest. Yeah. And that's, that's a part of the piece of surrounding yourself with quality people. You know, like it, if you told me at, at 18 years old, I was going to go buy a, a property in a different state, I'd be, I think you'd silly. Like I'd be like, why would you, why would you do that? And it's not until you've walked the path and had some education and, and listened to the reasons why until you realize, you know, why it might be a good idea or, or, or what are the potential success stories that you can come out of that. And um, I think that's a great one. And, 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 and why, Brisbane is it something that Daniel sort of um, you know gave you the you gave you the green light on I mean what sort of it drove you there was it was some good um, fundamentals I mean what what was the thought process around that one you know I had to be honest with myself and I asked myself like you know what do I know about property you know and I knew very little I knew if you're investing in property in the long run you might be better off you know, money was. And I was like, okay, well, that's not really, that's not much knowledge at all. And then when Daniel says, well, look, I think this would be a good area. And I said, I pretty much just said to Daniel, I was like, look, I'm paying you the money. This is what you do day in, day out. This is your business and you've, you've got an amazing business. I said, pretty much, I gave him free reign. So like, if that's what you think, then I'm on your side. Because like I said earlier, that's what he does. That's not what I do. Why should I tell him my opinions of where I want to buy because it might be completely wrong. So you, it's just that it's scary, but you got to make that step. Like, you know, if someone specializes in something that you don't, you'd be silly not to listen to them. Oh yeah, a hundred percent for sure. Especially someone who's actually walked the path before you and, and, you know, build a portfolio themselves. Why, why wouldn't you? Um, and, and so, I mean, what is, have you sort of thought about your exit strategy? Is there a, is there a time and goal? I mean, all that sort of stuff, or you're still just pretty heavily in the acquisition stage. And as you say, want to get seven before you're 30 or, or do you actually have an age that you want to retire? Do you want to sell off the properties and live off the, the, the earnings or, or live off the cash flow? I mean, how does that sort of look for you? Look, no, no exit strategy at all. Um, I'm still early on and I'm still learning. Um, it's just no age to retire as well. It's just like, I think it will come down to, you know, down the track um, when I am a little bit older in my thirties, forties, I'll just love to see how it's going. But until then I want to just keep chasing it, keep chasing that dream and build up my portfolio as best I can. That's really what I'm doing and see how far this can actually go. Just want to keep going. I don't, I'm, I've got no plans to stop now anyway, of course, but oh, well, it's see how we you, go. You're on a, uh, a very good trajectory there, mate, and uh, you've got plenty of time up your sleeve to sort of plan out uh, your retirement phase of life. But, yeah, I think that's a big commonality between a lot of the younger investors is there's, uh, there's no desire to retire at any point in time. I mean, when, once you get to that uh, position of financial well-being. It's it's how do you want to spend your days? What do you want to be doing every single day? And, and it, it sounds like you're well on that path and um, have no, you know, it, it's not. Uh, it's for you. It's it's financial freedom, definitely, to um, have that financial peace and, and be able to sleep at night. But obviously, no, uh, no, uh, want to go on holidays for the rest of my life and all that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, keep going, mate. I'm, I'm sure you're gonna hit all of your goals from your from your aspirations, but. Um, I mean, what, what type of guy are you? Are you a, a reader? Are you a podcast guy? Are you, uh, as you said before, like a, a mentor guy? Is there any sort of resources that have helped you along the way or has it purely just been that, um, that mentor drive? To be honest, it's kind of just been that mentor drive and Daniel's good for that, but it's only been Daniel. It's like right now. Right now is where I'm at a stage where I'm like, hang on a second. If I've learned so much off one person, it's like, what else can I learn? What else is there? And I'm getting to that stage now. Like I've been thinking lately, like, okay, well, I need to start looking at what can I read? Who can I reach out to? And expanding, who are, you know, all those things. Because I only know, you know, so much. And Daniel's taught me, you know, 
even more. But like, well, I'm at that stage now. Well, if I'm going to go for it, I want to start reaching out. So yeah, start reading books, start listening to podcasts, start reaching out to other people just to get as much knowledge as I can behind me to, yeah, like keep going, chase that dream. <laughs> no, that's awesome, mate. And um, I mean, is there any sort of, uh, when you were looking for properties with Daniel, were you, um, were you online a lot, like on, on realestate.com or domain trying to find properties and then send it to him or uh, were you just purely giving him the reins and, and letting him give properties to you? Yeah, I was having a quick look, a few, some, um, and I even um, was even found some that I sent to him and I was like, oh, you know, what do you think of this? And Daniel, Daniel didn't get mad or anything that I sent him a property, even if it was from a different buyer's advocate at the time. I sent him a property and I was like, hey, these guys are saying this. But I always just kept, I always kept going back to Daniel. I was like, what do you think of this? Uh, and he would just, he didn't get angry. He just sat down and he's like, look, it's an okay property. Why wouldn't I invest in that? And he slowed it down and he explained to me the reason. He's like, if you got this property, it'd be this, 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 and this. Um, you, you could even lose money, for example, or something like that. Um, it was just, I just pretty much, you know, it was more so Daniel was showing me properties because once, once, like I said earlier, I just gave him my trust. I, I would look at properties, but I'd, I'd just be like looking what looks good pretty much. You know, I'd be looking at the area and what's around it, but it would all come down to what looks good. It could be something, it could be something small to the house that I bought. I was like, oh, look, it's, you know, what about the flooring? You know, it's got a bit of tiles. And Daniel's like, yeah, but tiles, you know, it's better than carpet because if you buy a rental property that's got carpet, carpet gets damaged more than tiles. And it's all those little things that I've learned going through Daniel's stuff. So it was like, it was pretty much gave him full reins um, and put full trust in Daniel to find the property for me. And he did. And it's an awesome property. <laughs> Mate, that's such a, a hard thing to do. I mean, we all try and find these biases to confirm that, you know, what we found or, that, you know, we grew up in a, in a carpeted place and we love the warmth in the winter on our feet. And you, you know, it's so easy to try and find all of these little biases from when we were younger to confirm that the property that we're looking at is the right one. And, um, again, it's just having that, that, that second opinion or, or a sounding board to bounce ideas off and getting some confirmation back or, or getting some corrective advice back to just say, yeah. Have you thought about this? What about that? What about that? So, um, yeah, that's that's great, mate. And, and and it's a big thing to do to let someone, you know, have full reins of your financial well-being. So, um, con congratulations for that, mate. That's a that's a really good one. But, um, you know, you're a young guy. You sound pretty pretty motivated and excited and, and taking life by the horns. Um, but but what what gets you into that position? I mean, what what make what makes you get up in the morning? Have you got a favorite quote? Like, so what am I, what motivates you in life? Well, it's all that it's all that thing, like you know, giving Daniel the full trust, even though as, as scary as that is, it's just like I suppose they say you, you got to take risks to get rewards, um, and that's what I'm doing. It's everything's a risk you do, but and if it and every every risk I take uh, might not always go to plan, but um, it comes down to you know it's it's the whole like you know when you feel uncomfortable is when you grow the most. You know, your risk to your, the, when you take risks, it's when you get the better um, rewards. And it's just all those little things. If you just if you just sit in your comfortable life sort of thing and you only do things when you're comfortable, well, how are you going to grow? Yeah, You've got to take yeah. yourself out of those comfort zones. Yeah, that's that's spot on. And it's so easy for us to get comfortable, you know, sit in a job for, for 10 years and then you know, yeah, we're exactly. 30 and we look back and we're like, oh man, what? <laughs> I'm nearly halfway through my life. What am I going to do? And it's just, um, yeah, it's so easy to get comfortable and, and we get so caught up in it. So that's a great, uh, but look, great if way. I, like, through, sorry, through the process, but yeah, like if I make mistakes, no mistake's a bad mistake. It's just a lesson learned and you have to make mistakes to learn those lessons. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's spot on, mate. If you, you, that's the easiest way to learn. If you make the mistake yourself, then um, then you can improve yourself and, and, and be one better than yourself from yesterday. That's all you can do. And, and there's no uh, real mistake in life, as you say. It's just a, it's just a learning. It's just a lesson, really. So uh, in wrapping up, Michael, I mean, what to, what advice would you give someone else in kind of your own shoes or, or even younger who want to get into the property market? Is there a, a final thing that you'd uh, want to inspire them with? Just get in and do it. Obviously, it's going to be harder to start and a lot comes from that cash deposit, which obviously you'd need. Um, but if you've got that, yeah, don't wait and don't think about doing it. 
um, if you want to do it, just get into it as soon as you can. The sooner you get into it, the sooner you'll get the second one. The sooner you get your second one, the sooner you get your third one. Um, don't be scared. Don't think of what the worst thing that can happen. Think of the, you know, think of the other way. Think of the positive things that can come out of it and just go for it. Mate, I think that's perfect advice and I think uh, your story and that whole delayed gratification piece from when you were younger and sort of realising, you know, how you can trade money and the value of money and $100 shirts compared to $10 shirts really uh, it would excite people and, and I think your, your whole testimony has been some great advice for, for some other people getting started. So, uh, mate, I just wanted to say a big thank you for coming on again today. Yeah, thanks for having me, mate. Like, I really appreciate it. And, um yeah, it's just one of those things. We're all in the, we're all chasing the same dream. So we've got to help each other out. That's it, mate. And uh, hopefully this can inspire many others to, to get in themselves. Yeah, hopefully. What a story. If you're someone in a similar position to Michael before he purchased his first investment property, this should be an inspirational episode to know that if you put your head down and work hard to implement delayed gratification, you can set yourself up financially for the rest of your life. I'm always looking for more guests to come onto the show. If you're under 30 and have one or more investment properties, whether it's good, bad or ugly, I would love to talk to you about it. The main focus is to help other soon to be young investors with tips and tricks along the journey. Learn from the mistakes that we have made and ignite the fire to set themselves up financially for the rest of their lives. If you're interested in sharing your story, you can go to jordandeyong.com forward slash podcasts, where there's a podcast inquiry button at the top that will guide you through the next steps. Also, if you want to see what else I'm up to, you can head over to my YouTube channel to see the latest. Just type Jordan De Jong into YouTube and I should pop up somewhere. If you're keen for more content like this, make sure you subscribe and please leave us a review with any feedback for future podcasts. And until next time, happy house hunting.